Greetings to all of you and God bless you today. I hope everybody's doing well. If you're watching this video right now, either you are one of my subscribers or one of my subscribers has sent this video to you because they love you, or you just happen to stumble across this video. Whatever the case, you are watching this video right now for a reason. Give me around 20 minutes or so of your time and I can promise you that this may be the most important video that you will ever watch. This message is not going to be a message of religion. This is going to be a message of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ that can happen for you right here and right now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says the following, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Whoever you are watching this right now, all right, Jesus Christ is tugging at the door of your heart this very moment. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, we read the following. Behold, this is Jesus talking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The amazing thing is, no matter who you are watching this right now, whether you have Jesus Christ in your life, if you're saved and you're watching this video right now, awesome. But if you're not saved, all right, you have been invited to heaven. But you need to RSVP right here and right now. You're invited to reserve your spot in heaven right here, right now. Just like you see on the screen here, this invitation. You're invited to reserve your spot in heaven to you, whoever you are watching this video. Date, today, where, wherever you are in the world, it doesn't matter. RSVP. Before your death, none of us are promised our next second. We can, we can breathe our last breath at any moment. From Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the time right now, this very moment. If you're confused about all this, let's go through all this together. But in order to understand salvation, you have to understand the whole story. And you have to go back to the very beginning, the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis... We read about the story of creation. God created the heavens and the earth. He creates everything. Then he, cre he creates Adam and Eve. And he places them in the Garden of Eden to dress it, to keep it, to have a relationship with him, to fellowship with him, to love him. All right? Adam and Eve, or sorry, God gave Adam and Eve free will. Because part of loving your creation is not controlling them like robots. You give them a choice. It's free will. All right? So God gave Adam and Eve free will. He gave them a set of rules and regulations. Adam and Eve, through the free will they had, decided to disobey God. They decided to rebel against God. And through that rebellion that occurred in the very beginning, all of us die through Adam. <clears throat> in fact, we read in the book of First, the Apostle Paul records in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 to 22. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And in Romans chapter 5 verse 19, we read uh, the, uh, the Apostle Paul says the following. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So the bottom line is this. We all die through Adam. We all carry a virus called sin. But God loves us so much that he provides the cure, which is Jesus Christ. So we all die through Adam, but we're only made alive through Jesus Christ. The bottom line is this. We all miss the mark. We have all messed up. We are all sinners. And our sin penalty separates us from a holy a just and a perfect God. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. In Romans 3.23, the Apostle Paul says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah 64, verse 6, we read, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. 
In the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 22, the Apostle Paul says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So every single one of us, it doesn't matter who you are watching this, we are all sinners. And just like you see on the screen there, all right, our sin separates us from a holy, a just, and a perfect God. The bridge between us and God was broken down when sin entered the world. And again, that's when, in the very beginning, like we just read about a, a couple minutes ago, Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And through that rebellion, that's when the bridge between us and God was broken down. So our sin separates us from a holy, a just, and a perfect God. And if you're saying that you've never sinned, you're lying, right? We read in the book of 1 John 1.8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Here's the bottom line. We read in the book of James chapter 2 verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Every single one of us has a checklist. It doesn't matter who you are watching this. You can think that you're such a good person. You've done so many good things. And you might have made some mistakes, but for the most part, you're a good person. Not according to God. God expects perfection. Excuse me. God's law. God is holy. God is just. God is perfect. All right? And because all of us miss the mark, we're separated from him. He expects you, whoever you're watching this, if you don't have Jesus Christ... God expects you to keep his whole law perfectly. And the, the reality is, none of us can keep God's law perfectly. So no matter what's on your checklist, whether you've uh, broken one of God's laws or you've broken them all, it doesn't matter. Like we just read, it, read in James chapter 2, verse 10. Again, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So whether there's one thing on your checklist or you've broken them all, it doesn't matter. That makes you guilty before a holy, a just, and a perfect God. The law, the purpose of the law, is it points us to Jesus Christ. In fact, in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 24, the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. In Romans chapter 10, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. In Galatians 3.13, the Apostle Paul says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of a law, being made a cur curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. In Romans chapter 3, verse 19, the Apostle Paul says, now we know that what things soever the law saith, is saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. The law shows us that we all miss the mark. The law shows us we need a Savior. The law shows us we need Jesus Christ. You know, there's one verse that I think sums it all up perfectly in terms of the death penalty that we all carry because of the rebellion that occurred in the very beginning and the cure to our problem that we all have, which is Jesus Christ. And that's found in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So looking at the first part, you can see on the screen here, Romans 6.23, painted, beauti painted beautifully, excuse me. The first part of Romans 6.23, the wages of our sin is death. Again, the bridge was broken down between us and God when the rebellion occurred in the very beginning. And because of that rebellion, all of us are sinners. But God loves us so much, like you see on the screen right there, Jesus Christ, the bridge to God, right in the middle. The gift of God is is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So though, so although all of us miss the mark and we're all sinners, God loves us so much, like it records in Romans 5.8, but God, 
commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, so, the, so although all of us miss the mark, God loves us so much that he would come down. He would be born of a virgin. He became flesh. He dwelt among us and he was brutally tortured and crucified and shed his precious blood for you on that cross at Calvary so you could be reconciled back to him, so you could be forgiven of your sins and be with him forever in heaven. But it all has to do with the bridge, the bridge back to God, which again is Jesus Christ and him alone. So Chad, you're telling me that I'm a sinner, that I missed the mark, and that I need a savior, and that Jesus Christ is the only way to the kingdom of heaven? Yes. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we read the following. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. In John chapter 14, verse 6, we read the following. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, we read, the Apostle Paul says the following. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So the Virgin Mary is not going to save you. Buddha is not going to save you. Allah is not going to save you. Muhammad's not going to save you. Dead saints are not going to save you. The New Age movement is not going to save you. Religion is not going to save you. Your own works, your own human efforts, you trying to be a, do good things, that will not save you. Again, there is only one way to the kingdom of heaven. In one name that's going to save you, and that is through Jesus Christ and him alone. But Chad, you're saying that me being a good person my whole life, that uh, if, I just, if, I don't, if I'm a good person, that I, I'm, uh, that's not going to get me into heaven? Well, let's look at what the Bible has to say. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. The, uh, the Apostle Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. In the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says this, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And the Apostle Paul also says in the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 6 to 8, even as King David also, or even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is to the blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. The good works should produce from our salvation once the Holy Spirit indwells us as new believers. We should have a new attitude towards sin once, the Holy, once we become new creatures in Christ. All right? But there is nothing that we can do on our own human efforts, our own works, that's going to save us. And there's nothing we can do. No amount of good works will save us, and no amount of good works keep us saved. It's all about Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross at Calvary. If you're still kind of confused on salvation, you have to understand the blood that Jesus Christ shed for you on the cross at Calvary and the significance of it. We read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In Colossians, chapter 1, verse 14, the apostle Paul says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, we read the following. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. When you read through the Old Testament, you will see that they would shed the blood of goats and calves and make all these other sacrifices so that they could be forgiven of their sins. All right. But we're not saved by the blood of goats and calves anymore. Why do you think when John the Baptist saw Jesus walking toward him, he said this, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Because Jesus is our Passover Lamb, folks. Faith in his blood, the blood he shed for you 
on the cross at Calvary and his death, burial, and resurrection, that's what saves you. So Chad, you're, you're telling me Jesus is tugging at the door of my heart, but what do I have to do to be saved? Can you please just get to the, get to the meat of this issue? Because there's so many people saying different things. Yes, there is. Religion, legalism, false gospels, false gospels that are sweeping this world right now are confusing people. This is not a complicated um, situation here. In fact, it's so simple that even a child can understand what you have to do to be saved. Yes, you're invited right now to heaven, but you have to RSVP. Now, how do you do that? Well, the Apostle Paul gives you the formula right here on the screen in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. If you're asking what do you have to do to be saved and go to heaven, let's read this together. The Apostle Paul says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So first you have to hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. If you've never heard the gospel of your salvation before, it's right on the screen there in parentheses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4. Let's read it together. Here it is. The Apostle Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. It's clear as day, right there, folks. The gospel of your salvation is believing. It's putting your faith in your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ for you on that cross at Calvary. You're believing Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, paying your sin debt in full with his blood. So you could be forgiven of your sins and be with him forever in heaven. So the gospel of your salvation, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, it's putting your faith and your trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. You're believing Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose from the dead. He resurrected on the third day as it is written in the scriptures. But going back to Ephesians 1.13 again, once you hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which the Apostle Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, he was buried, and he rose from the dead on the third day. Once you hear that and you believe it, you put your faith in your trust in the blood of Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, Look at what it says next in Ephesians 1.13. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So once you believe and put your faith and your trust in the gospel of your salvation, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. There is a spiritual baptism that occurs when you believe the gospel of your salvation, you are baptized into the body of Christ. Again, it's a spiritual baptism that occurs uh, when you believe the gospel of your salvation. Again, you're baptized, spiritual baptism into the body of Christ. In Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist said the following, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, referring to water baptism. But look at what it says next. But he that cometh after me referring to Jesus Christ, is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Two different baptism here. Water baptism. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. And then we hear a spiritual baptism with the Holy Ghost and with fire right after that in Matthew 3.11. And look at what it says in Ephesians 4.30 on the bottom of the screen here. The Apostle Paul says, And grieve not, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Your time is right now. It's time to RSVP to the invitation right now. You're invited to heaven, but you have to RSVP. So it's time right here to repent, to believe the gospel, and to be converted to new life in Jesus Christ. To repent, that means metanoia. It means to change your mind. 
What are you changing your mind about? You're changing your mind about who God is. You're going from unbelief, dead in your sins, to belief, a new creature in Christ. And you're agreeing with God about your sin condition, that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, that you can't save yourself, that Jesus Christ did it all for you on the cross of Calvary by shedding his precious blood, and you're believing, you're putting your faith and your trust again in the gospel of your salvation, which is Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, he was buried, and he resurrected. He rose from the dead on the third day, as it is written in the scriptures. The bottom line is this. Heaven and hell are very real, literal places, and you will spend an eternity in one of those destinations. Hell's a real place. It's horrific. It's eternal torment. It's eternal separation from God. I don't want you to go there. Jesus does not want you to go there. But you have free will. That's a choice you have to make. And you need to make it now. Because you're not promised tomorrow. If you die rejecting Jesus Christ again, you're going to be separated from God for eternity in hell. And I'm going to tell you the truth because I love you. Jesus Christ is the only way to the kingdom of heaven. And he's the only name that's going to save you. And it's time right now to RSVP to the invitation. Again, this is to you right here, right now, today, wherever you are. But you need to RSVP because you're not promised your next second. This is from Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords himself to you to reserve your spot in heaven this very moment right now. He's talking at the door of your heart. Put your faith and your trust right now in, the, in his blood, believing he paid it all for you on the cross of Calvary with his blood so you could be reconciled back to God and put your faith and your trust in his death, burial, and resurrection right now. And if you do, I look forward to seeing you in heaven one day. God bless you all.